Welcome everybody. I would like to welcome you to this session on gender and everyday uh, peace building. My name is Elisabeth Brügel. I'm a professor at the Graduate Institute and I have the pleasure of moderating this panel. Uh, the purpose of the panel will be to introduce you uh, to everyday peace building practices in, in Indonesia and Nigeria. Uh, it will follow somewhat the, the, what, what people call the local term um, in peace building studies, where we are starting from the assumption that uh, everyday practices are crucial to building connections and knitting together individuals and groups uh, in support of peaceful societies. We also are focusing on embracing uh, rather than hiding differences and in that way uh, uh, find connections uh, across uh, differences. Uh, the panel reports some of, some of the findings from a research project on gender and conflict which has been funded by the Swiss program for research on global issues for development and is a partnership of scholars uh, from Nigeria, Indonesia, and Switzerland. Uh, the research in this uh, project has focused on uh, several regions within Indonesia and Nigeria. Uh, and it's worth maybe uh, reflecting a little bit as to why we are picking those two countries because they are actually not typically considered uh, or they're not considered your typical post-conflict countries, but they of course have had extensive experience in conflict. Uh, Nigeria has been rent by communal violence um, and violence that has been sharpened as a result of uh, economic developments, uh, but also climate change. So for example, we're focusing uh, on communal violence in Jos, which is in Plateau State in, Niger in the Nigerian middle belt, uh, which also has seen uh, influences of uh, farmer and herder conflicts resulting not least uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from environmental effects in the Sahel. We are looking also at uh, the extractive industry uh, and the communal violence it has fueled in Delta State. And finally, we are looking at uh, the state of Enugu, uh, which similarly uh, as uh, Plateau has seen herder farmer conflict uh, and displacement, uh, not least uh, resulting from Boko Haram uh, violence. In Indonesia, uh, again, there is a lot of uh, evidence of communal violence and uprisings that happened in particular after the end of the Suharto regime uh, in 1998. And we are focusing in the project on uh, specifically the uprising in Aceh, uh, which ended in a peace agreement after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. We're also focusing on the communal violence in Maluku, uh, which has erupted period periodically throughout uh, the past 20 years. And finally, we're looking at conflicts over economic development in East Java. So there's a number of very, very different uh, environments and situations that we are looking at. And what we want to foreground in this panel is the strong local peace building efforts that have emerged in these uh, environments uh, and that we have been able to observe and study in the process of our uh, research project. So let me introduce to you our panelists. Uh, you see them all on screen here and I invite everybody to wave uh, when I mention your name. To begin with, we have Arifa Ramawati, who is a, a lecturer at Gajamada University in Indonesia. I'm introducing people in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, our second uh, panelist is Rahel Kunz, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Lausanne here in Switzerland. Uh, third is uh, Professor Wenning Udas-Moro, 
a professor at Gajah Mada University in Indonesia and a, a, a colleague of Arifas. Uh, and finally, there is Christel Regal, who is a postdoctoral researcher and research coordinator at the Graduate Institute, a colleague of mine, and she is the coordinator of the project that we are uh, talking about. We will be trying to stick to time and you will see maybe various hearts floating around. Don't get surprised. This is our internal way of communicating through signs. Uh, there is the hearts. Uh, <laughs> but let me start with you, Arifa. Uh, you have worked extensively uh, in, in Aceh, in, in Ambon, uh, in particular in the context of our project, but of course you also have been very actively involved uh, as an activist uh, in peace building practices. Could you give us some examples of local gendered peace building efforts that you have been uh, particularly intrigued by in, uh, in those environments? Thank you, Lisa, uh, and thank you for making a brief context of the conflict, both in Aceh in Maluku. Uh, the context uh, that I would like to talk about uh, deeper after the signing of peace agreement in both areas, actually. Although in both contexts right now, the physical direct violence has decreased significantly, because it is now 15 years for Aceh and 18 years of Maluku. But uh, I found it what uh, we call as peace and normality are still long to go, especially to the people who directly involved in violence during the conflict, both men and women in Aceh in, uh, in Maluku actually. Uh, but uh, before I explore some more about the peace building activities that has been done by men and women who directly involved in the conflict, uh, I also believe that uh, any conflict will uh, leave space to my needs, particularly for individuals and also a group or parties involved in the conflict. And all communities actually have their own methods uh, methods to manage the conflict. Uh, of course, it is determined by their capacity and the situation, situa situational context surrounding them. Uh, what I would like to share at this time is about a group of women in Aceh who, uh, during the conflict, they participate directly as a combat as combatant uh, and. Uh, they are women, they, were, they are women, uh, at the time when they involved as combat, combatant, they, they were young, with uh, age around 15 to 28 years old, and their number actually is quite a lot, uh, around 2000, 2005 combatant, but uh, about seven, hundred who were really in, in combat actually. Uh, but after the uh, peace agreement has been signed between the Indonesia government and the Free Aceh Movement Group, uh, the women participation in DDR program uh, actually give them status as a citizen who uh, has all the right as citizen, economically, socially, and politically. But uh, the contact of Aceh actually, uh, after the post peace agreement has been come back as an ex exclusive domain of men, where, where men taking all the, all the perspective has, uh, are the male perspective and people who involved in the peace building process actually are male. So the former uh, male co uh, female combatant actually, they left behind. They unheard, they have been unseen, uh, and they also have very limited access to the reintegration program. 
for example, to the resources uh, as uh, former combatant, they have the right to gain the access to re the economic reintegration. Uh, in this case, for example, is comp compensation fund. Each uh, former combatant has to get the fund, but for the female combatant, actually, they really have very limited access to the fund. Uh, my research in Aceh uh, shows that uh, for the female combatant, uh, it required certain uh, power relation with the male, especially the male who have uh, in position in Aceh uh, uh, power at this time. So for the female combatant who has relationship with the leader, which is, which is male, so they, they, they will get access to the economic resources Uh, power, they will less access. So it is, uh, I, I bring this because I would like to say there is a gender mechanism even in the uh, peace building practices in Aceh, especially in the reintegration program. Um, however, the female combatant actually, uh, they don't stay still they uh, gain some more uh, confidence and strength after they directly involve as combatant. They also have network. They have their own peer group. They have their own sisterhood with uh, other female combatant. So somehow this kind of uh, social capital uh, has been used by the female combatant to set up their own institution or organization among the female combatant. So uh, among the female combatant came up some uh, local leadership and then the leader, uh, they gather all the member of the female combatant uh, in uh, each district. There are about uh, 12 districts in Aceh who has a female combatant and they try to negotiate with the uh, men in power to get access for the female combatant. For example, uh, the female combatant in Biren, one, uh, one district in Aceh, she is quite a strong local leader. She was, uh, uh, what do you call it? She was a leader during, uh, in, in the combat. And she also has a quite a high status because she was a niece of the GAM leader, the top leader of GAM at the time. So because she has a good position and she has a skill as, as a leader, she used her leadership to uh, get access and control to the resources, resources especially for the economic resources for, uh, for her um, uh, college, uh, female combatant in Biran. So she came to the governor offices, she came to the ex-GAM uh, offices, and then demand that the female combatants also have right uh, to get the uh, reintegration fund. Uh, because of she consists in doing this and she also has a kind of negotiation skill, she managed to get the fund. And finally, she able to distribute every single female combatant in Biran uh, for, for one female combatant, one cow. Uh, this is an example how then actually this uh, female combatant who in general has been left behind, but somehow in the very local level, uh, the female combatant managed to gather or to organize themselves in order to bring peace for their own group, for their own female combatant fellow. And not only uh, for the uh, reintegration, economic reintegration actually, the, some of the female combatant has really uh, quite prominent and quite strong in voices 
voicing uh, the concern uh, of women because in Aceh after the post uh, uh, for after the peace agreement it was uh, the Aceh applying the Sharia law to give very limited access for women in general for uh, public activities and also public accesses including the participation in the politics so for example uh, during the campaign time uh, most of the conservative uh, Islamic leader will say that don't choose or don't elect women because women shouldn't be a leader something like that but this female combatant thing this is not this is unfair for the women so they spoke up about about that they also criticize the leader who says that the women actually cannot be a leader uh, and they see, say it uh, publicly so this kind of criticize the male uh, leader who uh, limited the access of women to participate in uh, politics actually also um, we can give credit to them as an agent for peace building because they in with their own capacity they able to voice their concern uh, to voice their their they write also uh, their concern so i think uh, in Aceh, even though the situation is not uh, give uh, advance for women to uh, uh, activate uh, to uh, uh, involve in the public activities, but uh, uh, there are some example how they can do something in their own uh, limited uh, capacities uh, to create peace around them. Actually, Arifa. so this is uh, yeah. Arifa, th thank you so much. I mean, this is a, a, a super inspiring example of what we don't typically think of when we think of peace building, namely former women combatants. Thank you for sharing uh, this example with us. I'd like to move it on uh, and, and maybe become a little more uh, theoretical and academic. Uh, Rahel, you have worked extensively on peace building in your academic work, of course, and, and uh, uh, in particular also on, on the idea that uh, peace building should be or is maybe an everyday practice. Can you maybe uh, expand a little bit on, on what exactly that means? Thank you, uh, Lisa. Um, yes, so um, maybe we can kind of situate a little bit what we've heard uh, so far from Arifa um, in, this, in this context of the turn towards everyday peace building. Um, it's a turn that has emerged relatively recently in peace and conflict studies. And it's also situated within what is sometimes called the local turn and within broader kind of post-liberal approaches that criticize top-down exclusionary and more interventionist understandings and uh, practice of liberal peace building. So instead, um, uh, an everyday peace building approach shifts the focus towards the community concerns, local needs and everyday experiences of peace building both during and after conflicts. Um, this approach places local agents at the center of the debate. So what we've just heard from Arifa uh, kind of illustrates this and uh, social practices that can move a society towards peace. Um, this approach then takes uh, uh, or goes beyond an understanding of a negative peace that is you know, understood as, a, as an absence of war towards a more uh, a positive peace understanding. And um, of course, this shift in the peace and conflict literature is really, really important because it allows us to do exactly what we're doing in this project, to, to focus on the empirical analysis of countless bottom-up community-led activities that were often invisible or excluded from the peace building uh, literature and, and, and kind of, uh, practitioners' understandings. Um, however, uh, and, and this is where we come in, uh, much of this literature ignores the feminist accounts of the everyday. And this is where our project makes an important contribution. Um, so we draw on the rich literature, uh, feminist literature that uses the, a gender lens to analyze the mundane, domestic, intimate, spaces of everyday peace building. 
And these include various uh, activities and practices such as care, uh, spirituality, interfaith dialogues, art uh, initiatives for peace, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, so for example, there's a, a rich feminist tradition that theorizes peace and conflict through the ethics of care. Um, in this literature, uh, gendered practices of caring that shape the political space in the midst of conflict are given center space. They are crucial, um, these practices, in creating trust and peaceful relationships among and within communities. Now, um, as Arifa and Lisa already mentioned, uh, so in, in our research project, we analyze many initiatives of gendered everyday peace building. And so let me maybe give you a few, a few more examples. Um, in Nigeria, we have looked at uh, communities that have faced a violent conflict. And uh, we have explored how women's spirituality has contributed to conflict transformation and peace building in this context. And we've analyzed a bit more specifically what forms women's agency takes, what forms um, can women's spiritual practices take. Um, there we're looking into interfaith prayer meetings where you know, uh, women that women organize to sit together, to pray together. Um, they also transform uh, conflict transformation rituals. And these are done, uh, uh, you know, in, in very conflict-specific ways. They have a long tradition, and they all involve gendered, gender-specific uh, forms of agency, and in this specific context, uh, spirituality. Um, oftentimes, these spiritual peace-building activities have been understood in a in a more narrow way, and you know, looking only at what's observable. Um, and in our research, we've tried to look a little bit more into what's actually. Uh, more invisible, what's less institutionalized. And that's how we draw on the, on the kind of everyday peace building approach. And that's where this is useful uh, to look into the, the, the ways that uh, everyday peace building works in less observable, less institutionalized form. Um, then maybe let me give you another example. We've just uh, heard uh, Veni talk about Achi. Um, there's, uh, there's some other uh, examples coming uh, uh, other examples of, of gendered everyday forms of peace building that come out of this context uh, in our research. So there we have uh, observed from the various forms of mediation, reconciliation and healing, and how they've played a key role in transforming conflict and building peace. Thousands of leaders of villages, mosques, churches, but also normal community members uh, have mobilized for peace. Um, for example, we, we, we some interviews that, that uh, show how one particular leader turned his house into a safe space where men could come together, pray, and resolve conflict. Now, this happened in a, in a context where social gatherings were forbidden and where men's mobility was almost uh, uh, more restricted than women's uh, because they were always suspected to be participating in, in particular armed groups. And so these gatherings allowed men to meet up with friends, dissolve conflicts, and transform uh, uh, relationships into more peaceful uh, uh, relations. Um, in other examples, uh, we also have uh, uh, analyzed rituals that were used to prepare uh, conflicting parties for negotiations, to bless conflict victims, or to reintegrate uh, ex-combatants, as uh, uh, Arifa was just talking uh, about. Um, so these gendered caring practices facilitated dialogue between different conflicting parties and the transition of combatants and victims into towards community members. They also foster relations of trust among inhabitants of the community and we observe that this is one of the key uh, issues uh, uh, for uh, uh, peace building, uh, everyday peace. Maybe let me give you one last example. Um, we're now working on a, on a paper um, that looks at the context of Ambon where uh, young men are organized, have organized and are still organizing in an art collective. So they're doing art for peace um, initiatives that basically aim to create peaceful community interactions after the conflict. So for example, they created art ex exhibitions that led the visitors to walk across the city to neighborhoods that they hadn't been because these had been separated uh, uh, through the conflict. One important dimension that we can bring out with our uh, specific approach um, of this initiative is the transformation towards nonviolent masculinities through art. And this only can become visible if we use a gender lens. And so overall then, um, you know, to, 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 to conclude, 
our research um, and the examples I've just given you show the importance of taking a gendered everyday um, very seriously, and also the importance of using a gender lens, not only to understand the complex processes of everyday peace building, but also to work towards truly inclusive understanding and practices of peace. Thank you so much, Rahel. Uh, uh, it really gives us a little bit more depth and kind of understanding of what we mean by this very, very simple term every day. It's a, it's a complex uh, array of issues that are being picked up there. I would like to move to, uh, uh, to Christelle now. Uh, as uh, those of you who are listening to you possibly are noticing, we're talking about Nigeria, but none of our Nigerian colleagues, unfortunately, uh, was able to join us today. In fact, we had some last minute emergencies. So we're trying to fill in as much as we possibly can. And Christelle, of course, you have worked with our Nigerian colleagues and have also worked somewhat more in a comparative fashion, having both countries and all cases in mind a little bit. So, so could, I, could I ask you to share some of your insights on everyday peace building initiatives from Indonesia and Nigeria especially? And please unmute yourself. Um, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. And indeed, yes, a uh, thought of our uh, Nigerian colleagues that uh, unfortunately really, really could not join us today. Uh, so this is really just uh, trying to fill uh, some gaps here. Um, but indeed, in that, in that project, we've had, uh, we have been lucky to have this opportunity to explore uh, some of the dynamics uh, in different uh, post-conflict settings, uh, communities in Nigeria and in Indonesia. And uh, this is something that um, we have been able to, uh, to explore in depth. Uh, thanks to our gender lens, as Rahel just mentioned, uh, and our uh, local approach. And being comparative of these two countries obviously is uh, difficult because they are uh, very uh, different, uh, even though by uh, uh, looking at uh, some of uh, similar types of conflict, uh, we have been able to notice some interesting uh, similar patterns, let's say, uh, when it comes to uh, communities' efforts uh, uh, to manage conflict and to try to bring peace in their communities. Uh, and so let me just um, provide you some examples of these similarities that we have noticed, for instance, in Jos, uh, Nigeria, and Maluku in Indonesia, which have been both affected by ethno-religious tensions between Christians and Muslims uh, communities. Um, so uh, one of the first uh, dynamics that we have noted uh, that was specifically gendered was different forms of gendered authorities that uh, took place that were initiated really by the communities and that had sort of the aim of controlling uh, social groups and controlling the spreading of the rumors. And these gender authorities um, were organized around gender norms. This is how we, we uh, unpacked their gender dimensions. And one of the first ways in which gender has an effect on these authorities uh, towards uh, social and rumor control was um, that they relied on gender construct of who is authorized to display forms of authority to control certain groups and to control the spreading of rumors, for instance. And so uh, we've noticed that in both uh, Joss and Ambon, um, there was the mechanism of a check mating, um, a term that is coming from uh, some of our interviewees in Joss. Um, it's the concept of a woman in particular, it's not exclusively uh, uh, um, performed by the woman, but frequently so, uh, women having these possibilities and this authority to um, control uh, their relatives uh, in preventing them to uh, partaking in violent events. Um, so we consider that this checkmating effect is a form of 
gender mechanisms of conflict de-escalation that is deriving from uh, constructions and representations of uh, mother roots um, understood as a form of moral authorities that is conferred and yield uh, through uh, female authority uh, and forms of protection as long as it's performed within the uh, domestic sphere. Uh, how is gender uh, proceeding as well is in shaping representations of authority in a different way when it comes to masculine uh, authority. And what was interesting in comparison to Joss and Nambon was that masculine forms of authority in both place, uh, places took the form of um, elders driven uh, interface collaboration in efforts to tame uh, the spreading of rumors and the unfolding of violence uh, by uh, youth groups, for instance. So in both JAWS and in both Anbon, elders, uh, leaders uh, from Christian and Muslim backgrounds uh, decided to cooperate and to take oath, for instance, uh, in um, in deciding that they would uh, take action in case they hear any rumor, for instance, of uh, a certain violence being performed by a certain group. Um, and so um, these uh, community-driven efforts uh, for peace also rely on gendered representation and performances of authorities. But in that case, gender draw the line between uh, who is authorized and who is not authorized to yield uh, these authorities in these communities. And in that case, it was uh, mostly the elder um, uh, male uh, figures that were uh, granted this possibility to act um, in interface fashion. And a final example um, that having this comparative approach um, allowed us to see is that in addition to forms of authorities, we have also noted solidarities uh, and gendered form of solidarities in both places, um, understood as uh, you know, bonds that unites communities. And these bonds were um, uh, consolidated in spite of ethno-religious violence that were ongoing. Uh, and these solidarities were very often driven by um, uh, by women, for instance, when they cooperated across interface divides in markets, for instance, when they had to provide goods for their communities, they realized that they needed to actually continue to maintain this link, uh, even uh, in uh, the ongoingness of uh, the violence uh, between their own uh, communities. Another example is that um, women continued to attend um, uh, rituals, social rituals, across uh, phase divides, again, uh, within the conflict. And it, in such a way, they contributed to maintain interface uh, bounds uh, uh, during the violent events. So really contributing to the fabric, to, to try to maintain the fabric of the society. Uh, so to conclude, um, through this um, bottom-up localized approach uh, to exploring uh, uh, conflict management and peace building, we, we have been able to uncover very solid uh, and very, uh, you know, um, uh, localized efforts for peace that took some similar forms across very different settings that give you know hope and inspiration on how creative and resourceful communities really are and these are the voices that we really need to hear indeed when we are talking about you know uh, crafting uh, peace building programs for instance at the more internationalized level if I could say it that way. So that would be, um, you know, some of these small contributions that I wanted to make uh, to this conversation today. 
Thank you so much, Christelle. Um, I mean, you also uh, brought out uh, uh, particular insights from the comparison, the notion of authority, the notion of solidarities. And it's interesting that you addressed also the, the you briefly mentioned markets. I, I want to bring the conversation a little bit into political economy at this point in time, because that's also something that actually we have has come up in the project over and over and over again. And we have also made uh, lately a little bit the focus of our uh, of our analysis and so uh, winning uh, I know this is something that is of particular interest to you you have also looked at uh, gender divisions of labor in particular in the Indonesian context and the way in which conflict changes gender divisions of labor and as a result there's of course then different opportunities both to commit violence but also to uh, build peace could you share with us um, some of your insights on this issue? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Uh, yes, uh, I will emphasize here on how uh, peace building process relate also uh, to economic activities during, especially during the conflict. And my uh, argument is that the different pattern of conflicts, just mentioned already that we have different cases of conflict like in Indonesia, Ambon, in Aceh, uh, different patterns of conflict create a different gender division of labor and gender participation and economics. Uh, and uh, and this, the cases uh, I look at is uh, comparison between Aceh and Ambon. Aceh, we see that uh, the pattern of conflict in Aceh is a vertical conflict. This is the conflict between the military, military Indonesian military and the Aceh free movement. Uh, so uh, in this conflict, uh, we see that there is um, people who are not members of this group, they will become usually victims of conflict, especially the, the, the men, usually men who become more victims than women. Because usually, for instance, in Indonesian context, when uh, men during the conflict, they went out from their home and they met the members of uh, uh, Aceh Free Movement or the member uh, of the military um, people, so they will be beaten they will be the, the, the victims of violence. So in this case, uh, which is very interesting is that women then uh, took the leadership in taking uh, the responsibility uh, to make money, to, be particip to participate in the economic um, uh, participation. They become the seller, they, 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 they were usually in Aceh, they didn't do a lot of jobs uh, in public sphere because uh, Aceh is a quite conservative uh, in terms of how women they, they should work or not. So uh, before the conflict, usually uh, women, they didn't work, but during the conflict, then they replace the responsibility of men and they becoming the one who become the weapon of the family. But what is interesting here is that it's not just a question of how they become the backbone of the family, but uh, they were becoming also the protectors of men. They were avoiding violence, um, experienced violence. So here we can see that uh, there is a kind of um, um, th there is a kind of um, idea of how women they were becoming also the ones who create this building in this context, in the context of insurgency uh, conflict in Aceh. But the, the, the different case uh, we can see in Ambon. Uh, the type of conflict in, in Ambon is of a uh, horizontal conflict. This is the conflict of neighborhood between the Islam, uh, the Muslim uh, communities, and uh, the uh, Christian communities. So during the conflict, uh, the communities of, of Muslim in Ambon um, is not just Ambonese Muslim, but there is also the migrants coming from Java, coming from Sulawesi. And uh, during the conflict, these migrants, they had to escape they have to go out uh, from Ambon. And the problem is that these people usually they become the ones who take the uh, economic, uh, you know, like um, um, they, they did a lot, a lot of uh, economic circulation in Ambon, which means that they are very active in economics, in the market, to be merchant, etc. But they had to go out from, from Ambon. And what happened is that uh, women, they, took this opportunity to enter into labor markets and they were becoming, uh, they were opening a markets, a sudden markets, 
and uh, which is the same with Aceh is that it's not just a question that they were becoming finally the ones who make money for the family, but they were also creating peace building here because they were reconnecting again the communities. A lot of people coming from different communities, they came to the markets and they were becoming friends again. So these two examples, there are similar differences in terms of type of conflict. There are differences in terms of economic participation, but they have similarities in how a building piece uh, in, in, the, in, in the different contexts. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Vinning. Uh, this was fantastic, I think, and I hope uh, that we have shown you uh, the breadth of uh, what becomes visible if one looks from a bottom-up gendered lens as at peace building. We heard about uh, uh, women's political participation as former combatants as a venue towards peace. We heard about care as peace building. We heard about gendered authorities. We heard about uh, now uh, gender divisions of labor and how they uh, subscribe or what kind of peace building is possible. Uh, there is a lot of wisdom in these practices and I think, I hope we have conveyed um, how much there is to learn from people when one looks closely at situated local kinds of contexts and knowledges. I think they teach us a lot uh, about thinking about peace in the practices that we engage in in, every, in the everyday. Uh, thank you so much uh, for listening. I would like to share with you, uh, and I'm going to share my screen now, I would like to share with you um, uh, a brief that our project uh, has uh, collaborated on producing and that you can um, download from the Graduate Institute website. It is about taking a gendered bottom-up approach to peace building. I hope you will take the time uh, to read this and that you will join us in uh, this effort of making visible that which is invisible every day and yet so crucially important. Thank you so much.